So, I give you Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. I will only be articulate with another glass of that wonderful thing. So, <laughs> thanks everybody for coming. That was really good. Uh, so, welcome to the Medicine Show. The title of this panel is Reconceived Bodies in Art and Medicine. And uh, if you've read what we put up online, um, this introduction will be familiar to you. A dynamic conception of the corporal body emerges, with, emerges when art and science are bedfellows. Humanistic encounters with medicine hold the medical body into a new kind of cultural territory, which in turn brings new perspectives to bear on medicine. Ultimately, the aesthetics of representation we encounter in the space between art and medicine engenders new critical perspectives on the social, cultural, and theoretical dimensions of what it means to be human. This panel will touch upon the historical relationships between artists, anatomists, and medical practitioners, and bring together four distinct perspectives on the contemporary desire to reinterpret, reconfigure, and represent the medicalized body. We will explore the documentation and translation of human identity itself, uh, by means of biomedical illustration, MRI imaging, and scanning electron microscopy, all unique forms of picturing the body, which invite new insights on the gendering of medical knowledge, hybridity, body as code, and post-human identity. Finally, we will also consider how the visual display of human remains uh, relates to various philosophical conceptions of personhood, humanness, and the notion my pleasure to introduce three panelists today. Bobe Lyons is the first. Bobe Lyons is a Chancellor's Professor at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where he has taught for since 1985. Lyons received his MFA degree from Arizona State University at 83 and his BFA from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. <laughs> got a Madison person back there in 1980. Uh, Lisa has led the Science Museum's uh, patriation uh, 
you know, why isn't this made out of, you know, carbonite fiber and other things? And the reason is the garb for our historians has remained the same <laughs> <laughs> since about 1980. So I take that to, I'm going to put on this mechanical device that corrects vision <laughs> your period, and I'll be uh, giving my presentation on this ancient technology known as a laptop. So. <laughs> So the Museum of Historical Makeovers was founded in the year 3007 by a direct descendant of Mary Kay Ash, and it's an institution that offers shows that revel in beauty history, and it's meant to fascinate and educate audiences of today. Uh, it was founded in 2007. Some of the big shows we've done are the Grand Burial Exhibition of Gwen Stefani, which Patricia has already mentioned. <laughs> Here you see the G4 sarcophagus, which is the fourth of ten nested coffins. We showed the four most important canopic jars. And then I also curated ancient tanning beds of the darker side of brown. <laughs> and this is a family tanning bowl that was a <laughs> project. Now, uh, my purpose here today is to, t oh, before I, let me go on here. This is a picture of the museum as it is right now. And part of the reason we're so grateful to institutions like Central Booking is that our museum is closed right now. In about 10 years, we anticipate that the continued global warming will make our institution look something like this. And so we've had to close it down for a UV permeation upgrade. So during this time, we have to rely on other institutions to show our work. So thank you to Central Booking. <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to talk about the relationship between art and medicine and how it relates to some of the permanent collection of the museum. So this piece here is on display in the other room. It's called Les Lèvres de Cendrillon, or Cinderella Lips. And this is one of several illustrations that were intended for publication in Diderot's Encyclopédie ou Dictionnaire Raisonné des Sciences, des Arts et des Métiers, which was this giant encyclopedia project that was published between 1751 and 1772. Unfortunately, when the all illustration volumes were to be published in 1771, Les Lèvres de saint and other illustrations like it were lost. And it was only until recently that this piece was discovered at an estate sale in Lyon, France. Now, what I find interesting about this piece is it combines two technologies by a misinformed artist. So <laughs> here, this is uh, the Botox bacterium, or the botulina <laughs> toxin. And then it's also combined with this injection equipment, which was primarily used for saline solution. In fact, this piece is named after the latter, the saline solution injections. Cinderella lips was a process to undergo where saline solution is injected into the lips to make them fuller and you know, uh, for a good look for a, a night out on the town or a holiday party. <laughs> After a 48-hour period, unfortunately, the lips would begin to deflate <laughs> into a condition known as waggle. <laughs> Botox, on the other hand, or the botulinum toxin, was used to uh, fix the corners of the mouth and relax some of the muscles to give the much-desired pout, as you can see here. <laughs> now, uh, this look has been around forever, and here you can see on the so you can see some right here. <laughs> now, many people believe that he does not have the desired pout. This is Dr. Um, Eustinus Kerner, a German uh, writer and doctor who discovered therapeutic value of the uh, botulinum toxin and published about it in 1820, but he was not the first. So, in fact, this technology of using <laughs> bad sausages, which is where uh, the bot botulinum toxin came from, for the worst gift, uh, has been around for a long time. And so looking at this portrait of Madame Pompadour by um, Drouet in 1763, you can see that she also has received the same treatment here and here. So they were using their own version of the bad sausages to promote pouty lips for hundreds of years before that. Now returning to Les Lèvres de Saint-Grion, um, the fact that this has oops, both the um, Botox and the uh, saline solution in it, that, that would never be used on the same patient. So that's why this illustration is somewhat of a mystery. Why are these two imageries combined in the same piece? Um, the next piece I'd like to show you is from the 19th century, and this piece is called Tatouage Bas du Dos, 
or lower back tattoo. <laughs> and this piece is, illustrates the application of pigmented inks to the lower back region of a young lady. And this is meant to advertise her desirability and eligibility for marriage because at the time, one of the worst diseases um, that you could possibly have would be matelessness, also known as spinster disease. So this process was applied for that reason. I, spinster disease was even more feared than cholera or typhoid fever at the time. Now, of course, no one would actually see these markings until the wedding night, but just the mere rumor that a young lady possessed these markings was enough. Some of the most common designs for the lower back tattoo included the word juicy, <laughs> and then also the Chinese characters for love and cute. <laughs> and if you wish to know more about how these Chinese characters found their way into 19th century France and uh, England, please talk to me after the event. <laughs> Uh, what I find interesting about the lower back tattoo is the resurgence of this um, preventative medical practice uh, in the 1990s, which it was then known as the tramp stamp. <laughs> and in fact, it turns out that medical records show the most highly processed insurance claims between 2001 and 2020 are for removal of this <laughs> Now I'd like to go on to beautification of the nether regions via surgery. And this is one of uh, my favorite pieces from our museum collection. This piece is called The Brazilian, which is an etching attributed to the Wenzelsus Atelier, a, Ju a German art studio named after the former king of Germany and Bohemia, and led by an artist named Kate Wimper. It's an exciting translation of what can only be the Gross Clinic by Thomas Aikens. This is the original painting from 1875. And it shows Dr. Gross operating on a male patient's leg in order to save, his, uh, uh, save him from amputation. So this was an innovative process. The Brazilian etching, on the other hand, depicts a specialized Brazilian wax beauty treatment, <laughs> which involves full epilation or hair removal in the genital area of a female. Now, if you take a close look at the original painting, on the left, there's a figure that's cowering in the in fear. <laughs> <laughs> they are to believe that this is the mother of the patient who was overcome by the intensity of the operation. Returning to the etching, the Brazilian, this is a male figure this time. And so, in fact, many male art historians believe that this figure is cowering because it's the first time he ever saw the nether regions of the patient and was freaked out by the amount of hair. And the female art historians <laughs> believe that this figure is cowering because it's, a, it's in response, an, an empathetic response to the incredible pain associated with the operation. <laughs> now, you may wonder where these grooming things like the Brazilian or the Metro ticket and these other terms. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We're going on to the, uh, the Brazilian. This is a similar <laughs> etching. Uh, this is a male patient, so I'm, I'm sure you can imagine what that process is. And what's unusual about this etching is that, um, here's the original painting from 1889, also by Thomas Aikens. In this painting, the figures look quite calm, and uh, you know, looking at the patient is calm, the people operating are calm, and so many people believe that this is post-operation, and that perhaps they're just plucking a few extra hairs of the process, <laughs> which would explain the hairy wax strips here, <laughs> and then this male figure here has been overcome by the operation, which took up upwards of an hour to process, so it's with relief that this um, process has been finished. Um, this piece is also related to grooming of the nether regions. It's called uh, Manscaping La Forêt, and it shows here the names of different kinds of landing strip treatments, if you will. So we have uh, the Boisillian, um, which is uh, related to the Brosillian, or also called the Manzillian. And then the Brazilian a la Brazilian, Le Metro Ticket, which actually was not associated with male grooming, so it's kind of confusing why it's included in this two-stone uh, two litho. <laughs> <laughs> in case you're wondering, the Metro Ticket is, is usually a hair removal that leaves a patch of hair about the size and shape of a Metro Ticket. <laughs> and then at the bottom, there's two more processes. It just says La Cire et Le Rasoir, which means the wax and the razor. Um, this text here at the bottom 
says in French, with maintenance of the lawn, the tree appears larger. <laughs> 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 you may be asking yourself, uh, where do these grooming forms come from? And I'm really pleased to be here tonight with Beauvais Lions because we have one of the pieces from the Hoax Archive in the Museum of Historical Makeovers. This is one of the surviving lithos, and it shows. Um, Beauvais, did you want to talk about them, or do you want me to? Oh, um, um, I'm looking forward to the interpretation in the future. Uh, yes, and I, and I, and I to disclose this information. Yeah. So, um, but of course, there have been at least three PhD dissertations based on this collection that I know of from the 21st century. So, well, the current interpretation is that many of these forms uh, are reflected in three, in particular in the area of pubic topiary. Can you guess which three? So it's actually these three divination uh, beads which are considered some of the earliest designs for personal grooming in the nether regions. Okay. So now I'd like you to prepare yourself for uh, one of the more graphic pieces. This piece is called the anal bleaching lesson. <laughs> and this piece is also created by the Ventus Atelier, and there are numerous uh, etchings made here. It shows um, Dr. Tulp. This is based on the anatomy lesson by Rembrandt from 1632, although this etching was from about 1880. In this, Dr. Tulp is, is, and this is an issue for Lisa probably to comment on, he's showing on the anatomy of a, um, a cadaver, which is a, a, a convicted criminal's body here. But in the anal bleaching lesson, Dr. Tulp is giving a lesson uh, on how you lighten the backside area with a before and after treatment. <laughs> this, this procedure was quite common and it had a, enjoyed another resurgence also in the 21st century. Um, and according to one comedian from the time, uh, why get anal bleaching? Anal bleaching because you never have a second chance at first impressions. <laughs> <laughs> Before I hand over the uh, podium to Beauvais, I'd like to, uh, to tell you about some upcoming shows at the Museum of Historical Makeovers. Uh, so next up will be uh, Popstar Reliquaries, where we feature one partial sunglass lens from Paris Hilton, and then also Who Wears Short Shorts, <laughs> an intimate history of leg hair from Nair all the way to Harry Tights. <laughs> All right, so for those of you who have gone through the exhibition, uh, this should look familiar. It's kind of behind me to my left. Um, this piece is called The Cold Open. It's kind of a riff on the uh, uh, 
cinematic trope whereby you reveal an awful lot at the beginning of the film. Um, so the cold open is, of course, the open body in this case. Uh, this is a, an image from the College of Physicians. So thank you for introducing the College of Physicians and the Motor Museum, Beauvais. Um, and I'll just begin by talking about this piece by saying that despite the intent of scientific illustrators and anatomists throughout history to focus uh, pretty predominantly on the biological functions of the body, representations of the body are undeniably tied to uh, identity and gender politics, to the politics of sex and shock, and to culturally defined notions of embodiment. Lucas Killian's ornate and educational <coughs> set of interactive anatomical flat prints called Mirrors of the Microcosm, it's produced in 1613, allow the viewer to virtually dissect these human bodies. Flap anatomy illustrations such as these allow the viewer to literally flip through sequential images of the body, which are hinged in layers, as you can see there. Uh, they're hinged in layers over a specimen who, and this is always the surprising thing about these images, they pose unflinchingly in defiance of their own dissection, which is so incredible. They're usually gazing, you know, they've got a fixed gaze to the viewer, and uh, it's, it's really quite quite startling when you begin to take these apart. Anyway, um, getting back to the politics of sex and shock and to a kind of um, um, gender, genderizing of the medical body, uh, I think it bears mentioning at this point to say that when you pull the fig leaf down on the male figure, I'm pretty sure in this piece, I think it's a brain. <laughs> when you pull down the kind of swooping cloud-like form over the women's genitalia, it's a gorgon. So, I mean, there are definitely moral ascriptions to the genitalia of both of those figures, and, uh, and, and uh, those ascriptions are not, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, neutral. So, uh, this image conjures um, what Foucault termed as the medical gaze, which shifted the focus away from the body as a site of self, as a site of the self, to the body as a site of the medical, uh, medicalized uh, expertise and social practices. And what I did with Lucas Killian's uh, image here, I, I took the photograph um, and I colorized the viscera. And the subtle coloration of the viscera in my version of microcosm is an attempt to bring the body back to the site of itself. So for me, such images evoke less of a sense of uh, of a kind of abject horror or revulsion, but more of uh, the sense of the body as a self-realized or self-represented uh, 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 entity. Uh, for anyone who's a fan of physiognomy or a critic of it, you would know that uh, there was a period in history where um, the skull was measured extensively with uh, calipers by people who were um, fans of uh, physiognomy, physiognomists. So um, this references some of my source material for my work, and I often gravitate toward medical text for source material, and so I've learned a lot about the patterns of discourse in the history of medicine. And um, you may have heard of the, uh, uh, of the, I call him a character now, but I guess he was a 19th century criminal uh, anthropologist, uh, Cesar Lombroso, who focused his work on part uh, in part on the belief that the common criminal was a kind of a biological mutation. And this once well-respected authority on homo delinquents researched and documented the facial features of uh, hundreds of incarcerated individuals taking special interest in the female offender. And the subtext, of course, for this practice reveals a kind of a perverse interpretation of nature's underlying order and a, a little bit of an obsessive desire for collecting and interpreting data that expresses variation. So comparative physiognomists used uh, calipers, craniometers, such as the one you see here, to calculate the degree of the so-called disproportion uh, of their subjects. And the resulting data was used to chart the relationship between micro and macro features of the face, and then to ascribe personality types to, those, uh, to that data. So when I was a Francis Seawood Fellow at the College of Physicians and Motor Museum a number of years ago, uh, I had access to the collections both in the library and in the Motor Museum. And I started working on um, a piece that's taken a number of years to develop. Um, this is a, a current body of work that I'm working on now called The Mutable Archive. 
and it's really uh, focusing on the theme of mortality and what remains beyond our mortal coil. And this is a subject, I think, that has sustained both individual and collective interest for a long time, but uh, seemingly with increased intensity in recent years. Uh, photographs by Sally Mann of the Body Farm and um, uh, Jeff Wall's Battlefield of uh, Conversing uh, Dead Soldiers, which was then uh, referenced in Homer Fast Continuity, which was screened and documented in Castle last year, uh, and also the Guggenheim exhibition uh, a couple of years ago called Haunted, I think reveal kind of a contemporary obsession with, with uh, what remains after our passing. Uh, so in this body of photographs that I took of Dr. Hurdle's skull collection, um, I'm, I'm interested in creating a kind of partial archive and in uh, laying bare the, um, all of the missing parts of the archive. So uh, Dr. Hurdle's skull collection was uh, collected, as I understand, with few questions asked, mostly people who were executed. And um, there were post-mortem skull tattoos put on the side of the cranium, as you can see here. And in some cases, there was very little information that was uh, tattooed to the skull, and in other cases, there was some significant information that was tattooed to the skull. Um, this was a series of photographs that I took from Dr. Herb's skull collection. This was a 19th century collection. And you see the names and some of the um, crimes committed by the individuals who are collected in the collection. And then you see the archive cards, which have uh, original documentation and then additional information added uh, over, the, uh, over the years. And um, so in this, uh, in this uh, series of work, I'll be commissioning writers who will be from uh, perhaps curators of medical collections, medical ethicists, writers, uh, um, and also in touch with a spiritual medium. And these people will, um, will write fictional biographies on the subjects of this collection. Uh, mm. It's really meant to, uh, again, to point to what's missing in terms of these people's individual uh, identities. So, so I think for me, this, this uh, body of work um, uh, looks at, again, the partial archive and how we can create new meaning through new interpretations while honoring the historically significant, time-sensitive and ephemer uh, sort of ephemeral nature of what's at hand. And uh, the project, as I say, focuses um, uh, on ways in which artists and uh, other people can employ strategies to rethink lost histories. So, um, these are two of uh, the um, two of the specimens. One is a pirate. One on the top is a pirate. The specimen on the bottom is uh, a very uh, celebrated Viennese prostitute who died of meningitis at the age of 19. And it is striking when people come through my studio, even if I don't invite them to be part of the project, they will so, so strongly identify to some of the specimens. Uh, one of my colleagues came through and announced himself to be the Dutch suicide. Uh, <laughs> Eleanor Hansen, I was lucky enough to have in my studio and announced herself to be Francesca Sepora. So let's see what, what comes out of this project. Um, uh, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna move quickly. Uh, I also photographed pretty extensively the, uh, the collection of gynecological instruments. For anybody who knows what this is, you must be thinking, ouch. <laughs> this prompt, I think, a reflection on the surgical specialties and uh, specialities in the history of uh, controversies surrounding uh, women's health, especially with regard to the early pioneers of women medicine, women's medicine. So uh, Marion Sims, who is considered the father of American gynecology, uh, was a very uh, controversial figure because he, he uh, used slaves as experimental subjects in his work, begging serious ethical questions regarding the consent of human subjects. And it was controversial because supposedly he did en enhance the health, dramatically en enhance the health of his subjects, but it was unauthorized use of, of people. So these instruments that are both um, aids to health and that also appear somewhat as torturous instruments <laughs> is, uh, is something that I was trying to capture in these works. Um, I was also very fascinated with prosthetic devices, um, in certainly in the uh, College of Physicians, it's very easy and very seductive to mind the vast inventory of anatomical models and prosthetic devices that were collected for the historical uh, value, but which have since become, in a way, sort of fetish objects. Um, 
prosthetic hair goes back to the uh, Egyptian dynasty, 2750 BC. That is a real date. <laughs> and, uh, archaeologists have unearthed the oldest known split from that period. And um, I think the earliest, uh, I'm sorry, the earliest known written reference to an artificial limb was made in about uh, 500 BC. Uh, Herodotus wrote of a prisoner who escaped from his chains by cutting off his own foot that he later replaced with a uh, substitute. And a uh, more comprehensive history of prosthetics begins at the very dawning of the um, medical thought. In the um, three great Western civilizations of Egypt, Greek, and Rome, the first two rehabilitation aids recognized as prostheses were made in um, uh, 1529 by a French sur surgeon introduced, uh, who introduced amputation as a life-saving measure. So in these works, I'm, I'm very sort of interested in the status of the object as both uh, something that augments, but something that also, in a way, uh, presents a very sort of early version of the post-human subject. And uh, uh, here's one work from the series. And um, the, there's a tremendous black void on the top of these two prosthetic legs that uh, does suggest a, a phantom body. And perhaps if one wants to give those legs any kind of agency and desire or a, um, a kind of a longing for the, for the whole body. And yet it's an absurd piece because it is a diptych. And of course, if you've got a, a male leg from the uh, 20th century, a female leg from the 19th century, you put them together, you couldn't possibly be ambulatory. But uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a quintessential mashup. So uh, in recent years, you know, we've seen Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. And we've also learned about the proposed concept of the biopower body fragmented um, sort of uh, material form that um, has different um, positions of utility on different parts of the body. But if we move from the, the definition of the prostheses as simply uh, a replacement part to a more kind of uh, broad conception of the prosthetic, then suddenly we have a kind of constellation of human technology interfaces that we can consider that includes the notion that uh, at times technology itself and at other times the corporal body itself is a, is a prosthesis for the other. So, this is uh, some of my earliest work from the University of Michigan doing, um, finding yet another way to probe the body. Very interested in microscopy. Uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph uh, that uh, scans the surface of a three-dimensional uh, uh, specimen. These are histological samples of sites of sensation on bodies. And I, this was the body work that I showed at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I, regurgitate a lot of my images in my work. So the exhibition was in 2006. This is a taste bud from that body of work that I shared with a colleague of mine from architecture at Washington University in St. Louis. We wanted to um, produce, we wanted to play with scale and produce large scale sculptures from these SEMs. So we produced a data set from the taste bud, uh, played with different diagrams that would chart different levels of relief on this and produced two four by eight foot CNC rounded tiles of the surface of a wild mouse taste bud. That's what it looks like. This is, I've used it as a projection screen that has a kind of lenticular effect. Mm -hmm. And this is what the piece looks like. I think that is it. I think my time is up. So thank you. <laughs> Known for pr principally three areas of publication work his archaeological work on the upper right, his work in uh, creative zoology, represented by the griffin figure and the centaur and the medallion around his neck, and um, for the purposes of the uh, medicine show, Hoax Medical Arts. Um, Hoax, uh, whose biography is probably familiar to many of you, was a student at the London Academy of Fine Arts where he played on the polo team. Of course, like some of his classmates, he had to work as a street musician in order to pay for his tuition. And uh, after receiving his degree, worked uh, for a number of different publishing firms, including Murray and Sons, 
This is actually a photograph later um, after the establishment of Hoke scholarly lithography in 1901 when he's working actually on one of the elementary prints, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, after the death of his father, Phillips Hoax, he was re received a small inheritance and bought a press somewhat like this one um, and established Hoax scholarly lithography. Now, uh, he did not do this work alone. Much of his work was done in collaboration with other university, with universities and various scholarly institutions. Uh, of course, the Azudian work was done with Azudis Liberi, the uh, famous association devoted to advancing our, our understanding of Azudological uh, culture. Um, and here we have the, one of the major touring exhibits, reconstruction of an Azudian temple. Um, and here's the temple itself during excavations in the 1920s. Um, it in, uh, the exhibit includes ceramics, a temple wall. This is, of course, the styrofoam facsimile. It's a lot easier to tour the styrofoam facsimile <laughs> than the actual uh, original fragments. It has over 300 hieroglyphs. And, of course, the frescoes showing scenes of daily life in ancient Azudia, water carers, carriers, uh, the goddess Ninulam, the goddess of garlic. Uh, <laughs> this is Lakut, the goddess of bread. And so the um, uh, Sir Henry Creswick Wall Rawlinson described the Azudians based on Sumerian cuneiform tra uh, translations as uh, people who were accomplished in all the arts, horticulture, dance, cooking, and massage. Um, <laughs> this is Ek Eklam and Tulam, the ideal married couple here sharing a meal together. And of course, uh, there are a great number of prints that Hoax was involved in publishing, the divination beads being an example that uh, Professor Aoki Ayo just spoke about. Um, and of course, the ceramics, a punch bowl, a milk jug, <laughs> uh, a Hummer kazoo musical instrument, we're not entirely sure, and the vessel with an inverted spout. There's about 35 of these that are known to exist in public collections. And this probably also had uh, cosmetic applications as well. Uh, probably used as a neti pot. You'd insert your nose in it, <laughs> clear your sinuses. Azudian architecture. And of course, his other important collaborators who are members of, his, of, of the Zoological Society of America. I know our time's limited and I can't take you through all of them, but Charlotte Dallaire used hypnotic techniques in order to complete the missing sections of a lot of uh, <laughs> works. And in fact, she uh, translated these into a number, several volumes of Azudian poetry. Uh, Hymn of a Young Woman is probably my favorite. <laughs> so uh, Hoax was also involved in, in uh, collaborations with the Association for Creative Zoology, uh, an organization founded by uh, James Randolph Denton of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And in fact, this is a statue which was proposed to be built in Central Park here in New York, which was unfortunately never constructed in his honor. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there's many um, uh, examples in the um, uh, natural history record of animals that combine different animals, the dragon, the sphinx, and of course the centaur. Now, uh, you might scoff at these and think these are purely mythological, but at the University of Tennessee, we have the largest adult male centaur specimen <laughs> east of the Mississippi on uh, permanent <laughs> display in our library. And I invite you to come to Knoxville and take a look at it. Um, but the principles are uh, uh, um, zoomorphic juncture, which you know, the Assyrian winged bull, the griffin, there's so many examples. The basic principle is that God creates new species uh, by taking ones that he's created whole cloth and making new ones, like the dog bird here. And, uh, you know, just casually dog bird on the internet. You can find many examples of this. So. Uh, now, uh, I'm sure you're probably really f mostly familiar with, you know, those we might think of as magical or mythical, like the unicorn. And uh, we all know that the unicorn perished because only one of them showed up to Noah's Ark and had to go two by two. Um, and uh, creative zoologists were, um, uh, they're sometimes playful. I mean, I think there's a lot of legitimacy in their work, but this is one that uh, poked fun at Charles Darwin. And of course, uh, creating the long-tailed uh, Darwinist lemur is sort of a good example of that. 
Um, but in the uh, 1920s, um, James Randolph Denton, uh, using publications from hoax, traveled around the American Midwest and South. And this may explain why so many Americans today believe in creation science, because of their early education efforts. And uh, this is a reconstruction of a kiosk at the John Scopes Trial Festival in Dayton, Tennessee. <laughs> and uh, in the back there, you can see a statue of Williams Jenny Bryant. Um, also, uh, two of the kiosks were presented in Philadelphia at the uh, American Philosophical Society for an exhibit on dialogues with Darwin, and they were looking for ways of introducing alternative narratives. And so the basic principle is a kangaroo rat, very familiar to all of you, where the lower part of the kangaroo becomes the body of the rat, but the upper part of the same kangaroo attached to a gazelle produces the kangaroo gazelle. And uh, uh, this publication, Rare Zoological Specimens, shows examples such as the um, uh, donkey tiger, the uh, giraffe snake, <laughs> the uh, llama fox, and of course the trichopiscidae. Now the trichopiscidae are a very big category because they of course survived the flood. In fact, they flourished. Uh, can anyone identify which of these is not kosher to eat? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, the one on the upper left, on, on the lower right with the uh, cloven hooves there, of course, yeah. Um, this is the Microteris trichopolaris. It's the um, fish cat, or what's called the sort of bass with hairballs, and trichopolaris. Uh, and this is the uh, bull raccoon, uh, native to Tennessee. We do have fossil evidence of it. Um, uh, before the big housing bust. Um, um, this was uh, discovered by paleontologists south of Nashville. And I'm working in Tennessee to uh, designate a sports team, the bull raccoon. So uh, <laughs> based on you know this print showing it uh, wandering the hills of middle Tennessee, uh, in the future there will be thousands of sports fans <laughs> coonskin caps with bullhorns coming out of them. Uh, there, of course, there's taxidermy evidence of creative zoology. Um, here, for example, we have the female North American raccoon crow and the gorilla hen. Um, <laughs> and uh, here you can see the gorilla steer. Uh, this is from a Belgian publication uh, in Flemish, Mensap steer. The Vassarand, or fox eagle, and of course the end muskusrat, or duck muskrat. Um, now, uh, there, were, there were specimens. Now, fur-covered fish are ones that you usually associate with northern waters, Lake Superior, the Baltic, and so forth. Now, this is a specimen which was caught by Lester Morgan in the late 1960s uh, in East Tennessee. It's the groundhog fish. And uh, here uh, is a print showing uh, that fateful day. It took him an hour to pull it into his wooden boat. Um, also, uh, even further south, you can find the Georgia dogfish uh, of Lake Lanier as well. So I think uh, clearly, you know, there's, a, there's many parts of the planet we haven't really fully uh, comprehended, and certainly marine life is one of them. I mean, they talk about uh, biodiversity and problems with marine stock, but in fact, I think creative zoologists would assert that there are many species we haven't yet um, uh, caught in our nets, so to speak. Of course, birds like the uh, Burmese lionhawk. Um, this is a publication called Ornithological Quadrupeds. Um, the long-tailed um, um, marmot heron. And of course, the American badger swallow. And so um, with this work, it investigates the sort of mind-body split and um, 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 this interest in the sort of uh, anomaly, the medical anomaly, was really his forte. Um, for example, I don't think you could find a human torso that exactly sort of reflects this, this kind of configuration. Um, there are in the Hoax Archives collection a number of drawings for yet unpublished prints, um, and these are a number of them. Um, Many of which sort of bring together parts of the body from a variety of different, you know, from the head to the digestive tracts and in sort of the common pictorial space. And, I, you know, I think as we'll uh, learn later from Lisa, I think sort of questions of context and verisimilitude and authenticity and representation are things that uh, continue to uh, puzzle and plague um, uh, scholars and, and scientists today. 
in terms of you know gaining an objective context for things. Uh, Walter Benjamin said that the, sort of the essence of the sort of scientific rep representation is taking an object from its original context and removing it and putting it in this other context um, to form taxonomies and various kind of comparative anatomies. So, you know, clearly, um, since there's a great deal of unpublished uh, work still to be done, the, the work as director of the Hoax Archives, my work is uh, really laid out before me. Um, so I'd like to conclude with this quote uh, from the Chiquit Monograph series from 1990. Um, Everett Ormsby Hoax was writing to his brother Philip, and he, uh, this is paraphrased from the letter, but it would seem that an act of faith is made by those who assume that science is an objective endeavor leading to an accurate understanding of a given subject. This problem is most apparent in the study of cultures, particularly those of the distant past. I would assert that history is a version of memory, and as such is always selective, emphasizing one particular feature over another. One might conclude that the historian contributes most to our understanding, not through the accuracy of his methods, but through the formation of our interpretations. It matters little whether these cultures really existed, for in the final analysis, they only persist in our imaginations. Thank you. of any kind of medical training. He was an art student, um, um, but um, he had uh, done some internships in uh, gross anatomy. Um, and in fact, um, it's interesting to note that uh, the Surrealists were very much interested in the medical arts publications, uh, claiming that um, they were um, works that bridged the physical to the metaphysical and psychological. And, um, um, Works like this, I mean, uh, ho hoax often uh, played with the negative space and the arrangement of specimens. So here you can see a kind of face in the negative space there. <laughs> um, uh, this is the um, dissection of an abnormal organ. And remember when the word wo 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 was used? Has anyone seen the Wolf collection? Yeah, on the online. <laughs> so to give you some background, just a little bit of background. Henry Wellcome, who was an American-born, naturalized British pharmaceutical mm -hmm. mogul, was a collector. We can say a lot about why, why he was a collector, but the most important thing for our purposes this evening is that he collected a million objects mm -hmm. over a lifetime. And he had a vision, and he, he regarded this very much as a medical collection, but the vision he had of what counted as medicine was a very anthropologically informed one, is the easiest way to put that. So I was curating a collection within the Science Museum of objects that included all the things you would expect, prostheses and human remains and lots of materia medica, lots of pharmaceuticals, equipment, and an entire room of amulets, and an entire room of ex-voto paintings, <laughs> and a whole lot of ethnographic stuff that just turned up somehow. So one of the things I found myself doing as a medical curator, not an art curator, was actually policing the boundaries of what counted as medical <laughs> and what counted, what could count as art or what could not. Then you throw into the mix the fact that certainly in Britain, but also globally, there's whole rafts of new museological practice and legislation to do with culturally sensitive materials and human remains. So this is kind of me as bad cop, I guess, <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the mixture of medicine and art. So this, what I want to talk about following on these amazing talks is human remains, specifically, because they are the objects that are most likely to require these, this negotiation between these different identities. Are they human relics? Are they artifacts? Are they objects? Are they specimens? Are they artworks? And how does there is, and again, how does the context of their display affect how we understand them in each of those ways? Anatomy, I think, is the easiest medical discipline to talk about in these terms. There's a very long established tradition of influence and counter influence between anatomy and art, and you only have to look at this exhibition to see examples of that. 
both in the beautiful anatomical pieces there are, but more, you know, there's, there's far less about the physiological body or, and so forth, or the systemic body that you, you see. What I'm interested in is, is what's, what's, you know, the messy physical bodies that are there, even if the representation of the body is no, is no longer, obviously, that of a, of a human. So, if I could just go back to that fabulous flap anatomy and say, by the way, I'm now at the New York Academy of Medicine where we have many gorgeous flap anatomy books that you're welcome to come and see because we're open to the public. They are an amazing moment in the history of the representation of the body because that becomes a cultural, complete cultural craze in the 16th and 17th century where you not only have these exquisite high-end books, but you also have fugitive sheets, as they're called, cheap representations that you can buy, and people did buy. And exactly as Patricia was saying, there's this extraordinary overlay of politics and moral meaning. Um, Renaissance anatomy is often portrayed as this kind of secularizing impulse, but to my mind it can be better understood as kind of a reinvestment in the doctrines and practices of the ancient world, and it's highly, highly allegorical. It's highly philosophical. It's very, it's basically, it's religious in its goals and its content. So, God's ordered creation is being revealed to man because it is man, in order to help us understand the place of humanity in the world. So it's not just didactic, but there's, there's spiritual and moral aspects as well. It's, it's a very rhetorical kind of project, I think, that you see in these, um, in these anatomical, Renaissance anatomical pieces. And I think it's more challenging sometimes to untangle the qu aesthetic questions in other areas of medicine. Specimens, for instance, were created more often for the use of the discipline and there's not so much crossover into the public domain, or perhaps more specifically, there's actually resistance to the crossover into the public domain. If you think of a collection like the Mutter, which is in some ways a very classic 19th century collection, medical schools all around the world were doing this as a way of making themselves more scientific. And what they didn't want to look like were the freak shows and the carnivals and the fairgrounds where you could go and see something like so-called Siamese twins. So they're also trying to break, they're trying to break from that and they're trying to break at the same time from this Wunderkammer curiosity. They're trying to sci very, be very strictly scientific and systematically investigate the body. So they're only open generally to professions, professionals and they, they're very, Thanks to my friend Laura, who is publisher of the Mortal Books, amongst many other fine publications. I brought along an artifact, at least, you can look at, which is the, the early 20th century welcome um, catalogue. And when you look at that, I can assure you this is not about a, a public facing. The, the welcome now describes itself as investigating medicine, life, and art. The destination for the incurably curious. <laughs> Take it back a century and this was pedagogical, it was systematic, this, this was how a medical museum was supposed to look. <coughs> so I guess a lot of my job in London was trying to reconcile those two visions of what a museum should be. Um, and certainly anatomical specimens were some of the ones we got the most calls for, but they were the most contentious. This was particularly around new UK legislation, which I don't need to go into here, but certainly in the American context, NAGPRA plus HIPAA have brought a, a, um, a kind of analogous form of concerns to the fore. But I think what was interesting to me was not just about the new legislation, there were other cultural sensitivities that were constantly coming into play and it really depended on yeah, very finely tuning context of how things were being displayed and how meanings were being inscribed. So as I said, I was the cop kind of in many cases policing who got what was a legitimate use of this collection. 
And we had artists who were coming in to use the collection in a whole variety of ways. Either re-representation of the scientific instruments <coughs> or objects in a way that really highlighted their aesthetic qualities, which many of them absolutely have. And again, microscopy is another amazing area that I don't even have time to talk to about tonight. And someone's going to tell me when to be quiet also, please. Um, or artists using collections as a starting point for their own work, producing their own artefacts and their own histories. Or reinterpretation of artefacts as artworks, even when that's not what the intent of the makers had been. So, I mean, some of you may have seen the gorgeous, the, the example I always think of are the Nikisi power objects, these gorgeous, gorgeous African um, objects, which Brooklyn Museum gets it right. In my, they actually say these were power objects, they were medical objects, they, were, they have a whole raft of meanings. But I've seen them displayed everywhere from high-end art galleries to <laughs> ethnographic museums, slicing them in just in, in one, one plane of, of reference. So the example I have found myself using a couple of times to that really coalesces all of this is we had a curator, who, an art curator who came in who said, I want to use one of your tattooed Tomoko heads. These are Maori heads which are sometimes tattooed post-mortem, more often actually the, the individual was tattooed during life. The tattoos are highly significant, they mark the individual, someone who knows that lineage will know exactly who that person is. <coughs> she wanted to display it as part of a show on faces and identity next to two African masks. And her section was called Primitivism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a fun meeting. Let's just go. <laughs> the point here is I was simultaneously talking to the Te Papa Museum from New Zealand about the fact that they, and these, these are not that old, these are late 19th century. We basically had people's great great grandparents on display, um, which was sacred. So, one of the things that's happened in my time in this field is that the, it, it becomes, it's always becomes a question of whose interpretation trumps someone else's interpretation. And there's been a shift of agency. And now, more and more, both legislation and museological practice privileges source community positions on what does this remain mean? And how should it be understood and therefore treated? And actually, the, the Lombroso Museum is a great example of there are Southern Italians saying, well, hang on, These, this Northern Italian Museum has skulls collected from as degenerate, etc., in the su south of the city, of the, the country, give those back to us. So there's the, the question of repatriation can be very to look very culturally tight, or it can be very culturally diverse. And critically, it's not about physical control necessarily; it's about intellectual control. Who gets to decide which identity is the identity that is the fundamental one? Um, and there's lots of examples of how museums have tried to deal with this. What, the, to me, the always interesting thing is look at how they deal with the Egyptian mummies. Because, uh, for instance, the Turin Museum, um, Archaeological Museum, now has this beautiful redisplay of a preserved specimen where you have to walk up in order to look at it. It's very much all the way up, you're reminded this was a human being. And then you go in the next room and there's just like piles and piles and piles of mummies because <laughs> no one cares about mummies, right? right. <laughs> so I'm not going to go on at length about that, but I just would, I'd say the, the conclusion of the, the Tomoko head was that they used a plaster cast that we had in the collection, which was, from the perspective of the curator, a great compromise, and from the perspective of the Maori, really not meaningful at all. Um, and if you want to see this played out on a large stage, the Musée de Quai in Paris, which has retaken a lot of ethnographic collections from the Musée de Long and said these are the ones we think are art, is, is just extraordinary in terms of ex beautiful, beautiful objects interpreted as art objects with very little left of where they came from. 
So, really, my main, the main thing I want to be, kind of hopefully generate conversation around based on what others have discussed as well is how the collection and representations of bodies within the medical tradition has, cre has led to this creation of taxonomies as well as norms and how, how, dif how difference is incorporated and how these different modes of representation shape our experience of them. So it's these questions of visibility, intimacy, humanization, and particularly when you're trying to reassert the identity of an artifact as human, is this ongoing ethical conversation to which I think these kind of shows make an extraordinary contribution. seen it because I haven't been back since it's been installed, that the Florence Museum of Science oh, now yes. has Galileo's finger <laughs> as a relic of science, but it's, in a, yeah, it, it's treated in exactly the same way, only it's in the Science Museum. But it's been recently sanctified by the recent, I mean the previous book. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a relic. It's his forefinger, I think. But <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm not sure which finger is going around. Better than the pinky. <laughs> Explain the history of human development 
through looking at what people did to protect themselves from harm. That was his definition of medicine. And so, and it was, it, it was, it was a progressive thing. Hence the amulets, hence the ex motos. So, for instance, he would say, let's look at the intellect, the material history of the toothbrush. And he would start with um, the the sticks that the the neem tree that you use in South Asia, and then he would go up through the different forms of a toothbrush, ending in Napoleon's toothbrush, because he had a bit of a great man thing going as well. So <laughs> if he couldn't find something that fit into this narrative he wanted to tell with progress, he would get something made. So he would say, he would go, he, would, he had a whole team of collectors. He would send someone to Southeast Asia and say, I want the development of this particular type of bow. And they would say, well, no, I'll make them anymore. And he'd say, here's the pictures. Can you reproduce them? So we have lots and lots of fakes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they weren't for him. They weren't fakes. They were filling in a part of that narrative. Mm -hmm. So his collection, I would, it is unique in so much as it's, it's the personal vision. He also, in the later part of his life, became very interested in archaeology. For instance, he ran his own archaeological digs. So I mean, the rumor is that the Pitt River still has about four crates from the 1930s that have never opened out the back. Welcome or the Pitt River? Well, the Welcome collection got dispersed. So of the million objects he collected, only 100,000 can still remain as the core collection. Um, and it got, some got sent to LA, some got sent to the British Museum. The Pitt River's got a lot as well. And they say they've just never, they haven't had time to ask for crates. So, so I, that, sorry, rather, but the, I think back to your original question, the thing is that the mortar is unusual now because very few museums like that in America are open to the public. And that's, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary collection, but it's not unique. It's not even particularly unusual. Except in its preservation and public character. Yeah. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, we had a really fantastic visit from Ivan Gaskell from mm -hmm. our graduate school. Mm -hmm talked about um, the way the, the taxonomy of museums and the way that um, if we could imagine slicing up those divisions and dividing uh, all of these collections, uh, they're divided, and divide them with a different series of lines that we think about history, and we think about artifacts, we think about material culture very differently. Would you, have you ever thought about what it would mean if the human remains were integrated into a museum of other things. Could you imagine them being ever part of a, can you imagine the way, the way that you imagine what should be preserved about those, those remains? Would it be more appropriate to put them in a different kind of collection of other material cultures? I guess you're saying with which category? Yeah, is primary? there another category? Is yeah. the taxonomy wrong? Well, what actually, in my, in my experience, what, what was happening was that, and this actually had physical implications <laughs> as well as intellectual, is that we were, in response to new legislation, moving Tibetan skulls out of the Tibetan collection mm -hmm. into a human remains collection, because that was seen as more appropriate even though the cultural connotations relating to physical human remains in Tibet have nothing whatsoever to do with the connotations in New Zealand or in, in America, et cetera, et cetera. So actually what was happening was the opposite of what you're talking about. Oh, oh, right, yes. the taxonomy, the there was a reassertion of the humanness. And that became really important as well because if people, it's, no, it's no big news that the museums of Europe and, of, and North America are full of cultures, material, culture from around the world, some of it very contested. In Britain, the, the big one is the Elgin slash Parthenon marbles. And when I first joined in this discussion, it was all it was all absolutely thin edge of the wedge. If we start giving back ancestral remains, the Elgin marbles will be next. And what happened over time was a real division, and I think that was partly pragmatic politics as much as anything, um, to say human and there was also a couple of scandals in Britain where hospitals had been retaining um, stillborn material without telling the parents. 
Yeah, so that, that really informed public sensitivity to the point now where whenever you break ground on a big um, excavation for a new building in London, you take to find human remains. And now there's a public demand that they get reburied, which 20 years ago there was not. So there are also these broader cultural shifts about the humanness of remains. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that's, that's what's happening, it is that kind of shifting. Is that kind of shift that it is happening, yeah? Yeah. wrap it up for the evening. Thank you so much for coming.